a stalker from hell, a break-in by a stranger, and an unexplainable trail of blood. Headphones recommended. Listener discretion advised. Welcome back in, everyone. I'm your host, Chad. You're just moments away from true tales of terror that will leave you breathless. So brace yourself. This is Disturbed. open the show with a quick programming note. We'll be dark next week for Christmas Eve, so our next episode will be out December 31st. And you can now leave us a review easier than ever. Simply visit disturbedpodcast.com slash rate. Let us know what you think of the show. Now, our first tale of the evening is one that just keeps getting worse and worse. It comes to us courtesy of Reddit user CatReligion. Performing this experience is Addison Peacock. Being a Girl on World of Warcraft by CatReligion As a female who's been on the game for 15 years now, I've met a load of creeps, but only a few only made me feel unsafe. To start off, I've always had a laptop since I was in high school, a luxury back then. I worked hard to earn enough to buy one. My mom almost took my money I earned for drugs, but luckily money I made in tips was in cash, so it was easier to hide it from her. At first my mom was mad I bought myself a laptop, but she soon forgot, like everything. My dad could care less, and my older brother already had his own. So I started playing WoW with him at 14. And back then, girls were unheard of. So I got the usual creeps who usually backed off after hearing my age or they were young too. But not this guy. This guy loved that I was underage. I was about 16 and used to creepy guys at this point. No longer a noob at the game or fending off the creeps, it was no surprise a new guy in the guild started hitting on me. No, I was 16, dumb young, horny and stupid, but I knew I wasn't going to find love on WoW where you knew no one in real life. Plus, I had the ultimate crush on a guy I couldn't have because he was my brother's best friend, but in my mind back then, I only wanted him. So it was easy to turn guys down despite being desperate as hell for one guy. But that all changed after my brother's friend went off to college. I had a part-time job with my brother's friend, but girls at work surrounded him and I became demoralized I'd never find love. Cue 19-year-old guy on WoW, who made me feel wanted. I had a camera phone so I could send and post pictures at that age, and back then I mostly used Facebook, MySpace, and Photobucket. I lost a lot of weight my sophomore year, so... I posted confidently bikini pics and sexy pictures, thinking I'd lure the attention of my brother's friend who was 19. So when this guy, who was also 19, liked me, it didn't faze me. He looked the part in his photos, and his younger brother was my age, so I thought. He was extremely attractive in his photos, and even proved it was him in his pictures by holding items I asked for. He started paying my WoW subscription, which in the long run I realized it was to get my home address and real name. I was so stupid and heartbroken over my brother's friend. Years of teaching myself online safety and the ability to be strong against flirts was all but lost in the fog. We'd talk for hours on Ventrilo, and he'd make me feel pretty. I was completely blinded by this point. He sent me gifts, and I didn't even question how he had my address. Then he offered to drive and pick me up, and only then did I suddenly get cold feet. I had a good friend on WoW, 
someone my brother met at PAX and joined the guild and is still one of my best friends to this day, though we both aren't fond of my older brother. He's six years older than me, but never creeped on me, was more like the protective older brother I lacked. Well, at least till I was 24 and single for the first time did we hook up, but that's because we were friends for so long, but the distance led to it not turning into a relationship. He caught on to it through conversation and was my words of wisdom in a time I was lacking any of my own. He saw something was fishy when I couldn't. I told my friend I was scared to meet him because, dumb teenager logic, I thought he would not like me. My friend chimed in that I shouldn't meet anyone off the internet at my age. I told him about the gifts and I swear I've never been scolded like this in my life, not even by my own parents. But he always cared like that. He wondered why I would give my address to someone I never met, and the expensive gifts I got were not something the average 19-year-old could afford. None of this ever clicked for me, of course, because I was lonely and trying to prove, I don't know, to myself, my crush, or something that I could get a boyfriend. Like that, I told the guy it wasn't wise to meet in person, and my parents said I wasn't allowed to. That's when it went dark. At first, it was pestering, over and over, guilting me over gifts he gave me and encouraging me to defy my parents. While he kept bothering me, it it never once occurred to me he'd lose his shit. While my friend was worried shitless about the guy having my address, going as far as to drive the 11 hours to my house and explain the situation to my dad, as I refused to tell him out of fear of getting in trouble at the time, all while taking his spring break in my state instead of his own with his friends. There's a reason he's still one of my best friends. He has a little sister of his own as well, and she's my age, so his protective nature is natural. Eventually, he made me block the guy, and that was that. This guy was pissed off. He'd go on different accounts to accuse me of gold digging and using him. Luckily, my friend was smart enough and had the foresight to change my WoW password and even paid for my account for me, taking this guy off it entirely, as one of this guy's threats was to delete my account. But it didn't end there. It got worse, as he'd consistently find ways to message me and tell me how horrible I was. Till about a month had passed. I was walking home from school, about two mile walk in the wealthy suburbs of New England, which I had done for years, many kids did, as it was a very safe town, with no crime in it, or surrounding towns. Without a second thought, I took off with my 100-pound backpack, maybe an overestimate, put my headphones in and started my 20-minute walk home. It was cold, so I had earmuffs over the headphones, only drowning out sound more, too. I swear, if I could talk to myself as a kid, I'd probably just slap myself for stupidity, because Wow Guy knew I walked home every day as I'd talked about it. He knew my address, and I never thought twice. I was on the back roads walking home, and honestly, easy to map from my school to home as it was pretty straightforward with only one turn. At halfway home, in between songs, I heard a vague crunching sound of tires rolling over gravel on the road slowly. I turned around to see a tinted black car that you couldn't see much of the person in front. I jogged out of the driveway I was standing in front of, assuming it was waiting to turn in. But it didn't turn in. The roads were dead, and it didn't make sense for him not to go around. I swear the saying that you go cold when you're terrified is absolutely true. It could have been a summer's day at 95 degrees and my bones would have been cold. My heart just sank and my breathing was uncontrollable. I felt like I had no control over my body as I realized this guy was following me. My blood truly ran cold and my hands shook as tears formed and my skin felt tight. My body felt like it wasn't ready to fight or flight, but simply freeze there and die. It only got worse as the second time I turned my head to see the car stop. I stopped. My world stopped. I couldn't stop staring. Just froze and breathing like all my school books were on my chest. Crying silently, my eyes hurt with no tears or sound as I just stood there. The door opened after what felt like hours, but only seconds, maybe a minute. And it was, in fact, him. It was the attractive guy from the photos. Not a catfish, but something seemed different. At first I thought it was his angry expression, but soon realized he was definitely not 19. More like 30 plus. 
I could barely think over the loud sound of my heart racing as it froze me in place. I thought I was about to throw up as he spoke to me. He told me to get in the car or he'd light my house on fire and kill my dog in front of me. I honestly just couldn't move, couldn't reach for my phone as his words just froze me. And like some magic, we both failed to notice the little old lady on her porch watching this play out. Suddenly, I hear her yell, Get away from that girl right now before I burn you alive. We both turned to meet her eyes, pissed off small lady about 60 or 70 with white hair. I think she noticed my frozen in fear state as she told me to get over to her quickly. Like that, I ran over to her, tossing off my heavy brick of a backpack. It was obvious he was unsure what to do next as he stood there and watched me run to her. Must have been a sight, this tiny, thin old lady standing in front of a teenage girl yelling at this man to go away. Like that, Savior Number 2 joined the battle as her husband stepped out. Guy who looked like he'd been through a war or two, with a shotgun of all things and booming voice. Gun pointed, saying, I've shot and killed men for less reason, you better leave now. He got into his car and drove off as I simply collapsed. All that fear just came out as I cried harder and harder as my brain sifted through the past few months of mistakes. After calming me down enough to speak in non-hyperventilating words, she asked me if I knew him. I told her kind of, but only online from a video game, not real life. Of course it wasn't easy, and her husband couldn't grasp why I'd want to pretend I was at war. I'm sure in his experience he was thinking Call of Duty, not magical creatures in a game called World of Warcraft. She got on the phone with the school counselor, her daughter apparently, and told her my name. I was well known to her daughter, ironically, but it was only 250 or less kids in the school and the town itself was small. Many staff at our school had family in town. Kids at school they were related to either by their own children or their siblings' children. It was the kind of town if you didn't leave by a certain age, you were stuck there. So honestly, it seems ironic, but entirely not a huge surprise. The counselor was well aware of my family and my mom's drug addiction as child services had been involved a few times. She came by in 10 minutes to pick me up and asked me a ton of questions, of course knowing I didn't want to involve police as I was scared of being taken away from my parents again. FYI, foster care was worse than a drugged out mom on prescriptions. We weren't rich, but we were more well off than many. Though my mom worked, my dad kept my mom on a tight budget to keep her from buying prescriptions from Canada she wasn't prescribed, hence her trying to take my money. She knew all of this and knew, though rough, I was better off than foster care, which was a gamble with losing odds at best. Plus two more years and I'd be off to college anyway. So we didn't involve the cops, but she made me promise to take the bus every day and to inform my dad of the situation. She also called my dad at work to inform him, and even had a teacher make sure I got on the bus every day till I graduated, even. Really sucked, but I understood. If it ended there, it would be nice, but there's still a bit more. Two days after this, my dad had to fly out for business. My brother was off at college, so it left me and my high mom, who promised my dad she'd stay sober while he was gone, but I was used to helping her while she was high, was like taking care of a child. But I was on edge, as every creak in that big house from the 60s, cat stir at night, and dog barking outside set me on edge. I barely slept. My friend from WoW called every night making sure I was okay for the past month. I lived in the middle of the woods, next to a huge river in my backyard, so there was still a lot of wildlife outside in the dead silence of cold months. Running water is an important source of water when lakes freeze. I had been used to all the bumps in the night, cats coming and going, and dog barking at every animal in the yard, but it all seemed new to me as I laid in bed, trying to drown out my fears. The house I grew up in was a six-bedroom house. I had a little sister, too, but she stayed with my grandma in another state, per court order, while I was allowed to choose due to her only being nine and me sixteen. The other rooms were used as game room, office for my dad, and guest room mostly for when my sister visited. My grandma and her had a room. So in a large house like that in the middle of the woods, it was scary to virtually be alone because my mom accounted for defenseless. I was letting my cat inside for the night. Five cats who all knew to come in at night for dinner and stayed in till morning. And at the end of the long driveway between my neighbor and our house was parked 
a black car. I quickly shut the door and locked it after my cat got inside. I made sure all five doors were locked and even put cardboard on the glass doors to the pool. I don't know, hoping if he broke them it would delay him if that car was his. I went and turned off all the lights and got all my cats into one room so I knew they were safe. Here's the thing about my dog. He's untrained for the most part, but was basically a giant lab puppy in his mind. But he growled at strangers, not barked like at animals. We had to keep him outside if we had guests, but he never bit anyone, and if you spent enough time around him, he'd eventually accept you. Also, he didn't growl at all strangers either, so he wasn't the most reliable guard dog either. But he was big, and deep bark. I mulled over what to do as I sat there in the dark with my dog, waiting for a shadow to pass by the window. I eventually went upstairs to my mom's room and woke her up from her sleeping pill slumber. Groggy and still kind of high, she didn't quite grasp what I was telling her till I started crying. She sort of sobered up and asked me to get her some coffee, and I did, all while I'm watching my dog's every move because I know he could sense something before I did. As my mom sobered, her fear in her eyes grew. Eventually, she got the idea to call my neighbors and ask them if they knew the car. After all said no, two of the men went out of their house to check the car together. The car was empty. At closer inspection, though, they noticed it was a newer car, a Lexus, and in the passenger seat was a laptop. The car was locked, but with a flashlight you could see somewhat into the tinted windows. They never told us why, but something they saw in the car prompted them to call the local sheriff. Only one and he lived in town sort of thing. We were too small to have a police department. He drove over about 15 minutes later, ran the plates, and asked the houses around about it. Apparently it was a rental car from Ohio, and he was calling to see who it was rented to, but the offices were closed, I think. He stuck around in his car for about an hour, until someone came out of the woods and ran back in as the cop turned his spotlight on him. I couldn't see what he was pointing at with his light, as it was at the side of my house and I was looking at the front. I guess he called for backup, as three other cop cars showed up in five minutes of it from the neighboring town highway patrol. At which a lady cop got out, I asked to speak with her and have her call my counselor at school to explain who that might be. I was pretty shy back then, but I don't know, something about a female cop made me feel more comfortable to open up to. I told her the gist of the story. Then she called my counselor who backed up my story, but also explaining why I was scared of cops because of my history with foster care and not wanting to go back. At which a mostly sober mom joined me, hugging me, doing her typical apologetic routine, but also offering much needed comfort as she called my dad too. Eventually the lady cop asked if she could take a look around the house to see if things were secure and get any information from my laptop about him. In her search, she found something I didn't think about checking. The basement door was not just unlocked, but open. It's never unlocked, so I didn't even think to check it, as our backyard floods in the spring due to beaver dams, and it's got extra seals and stuff to prevent the basement from flooding, again. But the stuff sealing it, which was mostly sandbags and stuff, were set aside. But the door at the bottom of the stairs was locked still, though it had some damage like someone tried picking it. But he had access to half the basement that was storage. Basement was sectioned and the other half used to be used for my brother's parties. The door between the sections was like a front door, not an indoor door. As in the summer, my dad had left the hatch open to dry out the basement and adjust pool settings as it was basically the pool house and the cats loved it so it also had a few cat beds. The section that led upstairs was locked from the inside and the wall and door were not drywall and cheap door, but lock and key heavy door, and the wall was brick. Upon noticing this, my dad confirmed he had not left it open. My suspicions that black car was his was pretty much confirmed. As we walked through the house to make sure everything was still safe, she got on my laptop as they searched the woods. I gave her everything I had, his photos, username, and she even checked to see if his credit card was still on my account, but it wasn't. But... The last few digits were. She then asked to take my laptop for a few days, as she thought she could get some good evidence from it. I asked her to please not damage it, and return it as soon as possible because I used it a lot. Before smartphones, it was all I had. After a few hours and onlooking neighbors had gone to bed, the cops came back empty-handed, but left a cop outside our house and towed the guy's car. 
From what the lady cop told me, what permitted such fear was in the car, there was two guns, some sort of rope, and handcuffs. And the guy who ran back into the dense woods was wearing a winter ski mask, not out of season, but suspicious nonetheless. So eventually, I try and lay down and go to sleep, but pretty sure I was going to call out sick tomorrow and kept all my cats inside for the day. I was too restless to sleep. Every sound made me so scared. My mom slept with the dog in her room. I'm very allergic to animals, but less to cats, as I kind of built up a tolerance to cats, but not dogs. And my cats slept in my room most nights by choice, as my room was usually the warmest. At 3.30 a.m.-ish, I heard a knock at the back door, and a guy say, Undercover police officer, open up. I was still awake as I walked downstairs to make out a guy standing in the dark with a gun. As he saw me, he demanded I let him in now, and he needed to speak with me. Something felt off. My gut knew it before I did that this guy's voice seemed forced, like someone purposefully making their voice deeper. And why was he at the back door? So I turned on a light outside, and sure enough, it was him. I just screamed. As quickly as I screamed, he started hitting the door hard. It wasn't a very loud horror movie scream, but more like a gasp scream. I don't think the fear in my body had a loud scream to let out. But the banging was pretty loud as I ran to the front to see if the officer was still outside. He was, but he wasn't getting out of his car. I didn't want to run outside as I'm not a fast runner, so I turned the porch lights on and off a couple of times, but still nothing. After a minute, my dog came bolting down to the door, barking and growling, nearly foaming at the mouth. Soon followed my mom, who yelled she had a gun. She didn't, but bluff is bluff. Somehow during all this, the cop outside had snuck around back and had his gun pointed at him, yelling to put his gun down. I hid as the rest went down, but he was arrested. No trial needed me to attend, and my statement was enough. Come to find he wasn't even American. His car was rented under his friend's name. And after all was done, he was deported back to Canada. I assumed something with his passport would prevent him from coming back to the USA, as the cop reassured me he couldn't come back to the USA now. I don't know what exactly he was charged with, but I think my dad said aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, attempted kidnapping, and something else. And also, it turned out he was 32 years old, not 19. So I assume me being a minor carried a charge. And life moved on from there. I had plenty of creeps before and after, but he was by far the worst from WoW. I had a couple from streaming, but I was an adult and much better at staying safe online. Only one worse than this guy was my ex-boyfriend's cousin who made my life hell for a couple years. But that's a story for another time. And now, a quick shout out to our newest Patreon members Megan, Sam, Gabrielle DeShazer, and Callista Reed. Thanks for supporting the show. They're all enjoying an ad free listening experience, early access, and our bonus series of disturbing calls. Five bonus episodes await all Patreon members and are available to binge right now with a new one every month. Visit patreon.com slash disturbed podcast to join today. Next up, Reddit user Risk Fantastic brings us his story of a stranger entering his home. Performing this experience is Tom Aglio. This happened when I was about 12 years old in Kansas. I was sitting in my bedroom playing Halo. My parents were both out running errands and my sister was at work. So I was home alone with my two dogs, a little terrier and a Bichon Frise. Not exactly the attack dog breeds, more like early warning systems at best. I had been home alone before, it really was not a big deal. We lived in a pretty safe part of town that never had any problems other than one time where some people sprayed KKK graffiti on some public park equipment. Anyway, I was kicking back in my chair, Doritos in one hand, controller in the other, full gamer mode, when I heard the very distinct sound of my door open and close like someone had just come in. 
The room I was in faced in such a way where I could not see the front door. My dogs got up and ran into the living room, and so I just assumed my parents were home. I shouted for my mom to confirm this. I'm a bit paranoid due to the aforementioned being a weird shit magnet, and I heard no response. My dogs also were not barking like they normally do when someone gets home. I thought that was kind of weird, so I paused my game and walked out into the living room. Nothing. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I had heard someone come in, clear as day. I was not wearing headphones, I had the TV turned down and was listening to music, so I know it couldn't have been the game. I immediately went to my parents' closet and grabbed our shotgun, like a good Midwest boy tends to do. The only problem was that I did not know where my dad kept the shells, so my plan was to fake it and hope they didn't have a gun of their own. Stupid plan, I wasn't the brightest kid. At this point, doubt started to kick in. Had I actually heard the door? Was it the game? But then I thought, why would the dogs jump up like that if it was? I walked back into my living room, unloaded shotgun pointing in front of me. I tried to call my dad. He didn't pick up. I tried to call my mom. She didn't pick up. I tried to call two of my best friends. They didn't pick up. My 12-year-old mind immediately jumped to, holy fuck, they're all dead. And so for the first time in my life, I had to call 911. The operator picked up. I explained the situation with tears in my eyes from fear. She told me to stay calm and that police were on their way. The difficult part about staying calm was that there was a hallway by my front door. I knew in my heart of hearts there was someone in that hallway about to jump out and really fuck my day up. My two dogs were right by me, also staring towards the hallway. This did not help the fear. I stood there rooted to the spot for what felt like an hour, but was actually only a few minutes. The operator's voice in my ear telling me to stay calm. Thankfully, my parents opened the front door. What the fuck are you doing? I explained to my father the situation we are currently in. He grabs his pistol from the front room, didn't know that was there, thanks dad, and we go a-hunting. I always thought it would be cool to go around clearing rooms and shit like a SWAT team, but fuck if I wasn't about to shit myself every time we opened bedroom door. We didn't find anything. The police arrived shortly after and told us that this had been happening over the past few weeks. People wait until homeowners leave, check the door, and if it's unlocked, they go in and take valuables. They said whoever it was probably left when they heard that someone was home, which never quite sat right with me because I only heard the door open and close once. Ever since this happened, I have triple checked every door and window lock whenever I am home alone. To whoever walked into my house that day, I never saw you, and I really hope I never do. As a fun little postscript to the story, I told it to one of my friends and he goes, you only heard the door once? You probably heard them leaving, not entering then. They were already in the house. That was not comforting. Well, folks, here we are, at the tail end of this week's episode. But there's no reason to despair. After the break, I'll bring you our final tale of the evening. Hey everyone, Nicole Goodnight here, letting you know that this episode is made possible by Factor. Do you struggle to find the time and energy to consistently eat healthy? You're not alone, and there's a solution. Introducing Factor, the all-in-one meal delivery service that preps, cooks, and delivers fresh, never frozen, fully prepared meals directly to your door weekly. With Factor, every meal is designed by dietitians and handcrafted by world-class chefs, keeping your taste buds happy and your waistline trim. What's more, the menu changes every week, so you never lose interest in eating healthy. Right now, Factor is offering disturbed listeners $50 off over their first two weeks. Just go to factor75.com, pick your meals, and use code PODCAST50 at checkout to claim this limited time offer. That's factor75.com, code PODCAST50. And with that, we've reached our final experience. Picture this. You walk outside your home and right into a truly nightmarish scene. A trail of blood stretching across your property, with markings indicating that it was left by a person, not an animal. This was the horror awaiting Reddit user C1C3K. 
and join me in welcoming our newest guest narrator to the show, Zoe Bolin. This happened close to 20 years ago. I was visiting my parents at their house for a week, sometime in late spring or early summer. One morning, my mom woke me up and asked me to come out to the front yard to look at something. Her tone tipped me off to the fact that she was unnerved by whatever it was she had found. She was standing at the end of our sidewalk when I joined her, where she pointed to something where the sidewalk abutted the driveway. Is that what I think it is? It was a trail of dried or drying blood. I could see a few spatters of blood trailing out into the unpaved driveway, but they were hard to discern against the reddish clay and sand of the drive. I soon lost the trail, although the general trajectory was toward the road in front of the house. The other end of the trail led down where the sidewalk turned to run toward the gate between the house and the garage. Enough blood had been lost for there to be large splotches visible on the liriope that borders the sidewalk as well as on the small patch of lawn between the sidewalk and the north side of the house. The trail led to the holly hedge that grows next to the house. Some of the branches on one of the bushes were bent and broken, the leaves smeared with blood, as was the side of the house behind the holly bush. And there was a sizable, maybe 10 to 12 inches across, stain on the soil beneath it. The ivy on the fence next to the bush was also spattered, with some leaves entirely coated in blood. For context, my parents' house is in a small town. The house and garage are separate structures, with an ivy-covered chain-link fence running between the house and garage to separate the front yard from the back. The lot faces the main north-south road through town, while behind the lot is a street that runs north between their lot and a neighbor's house, then makes a sharp turn to the west, away from my parents' yard. Following that street leads you to another neighborhood on the right, while the left side of the street is bordered by a heavily wooded area that eventually connects with a large swath of mostly unpopulated forest and swamp. From the amount of blood by the holly, we judged that someone had hidden there for a little while. Some of the ivy was pulled away from the fence between the house and garage, so it was clear this person had climbed over the fence. From there, the trail became much more clear as it went across the concrete patio between the house and garage. There's a window AC unit sticking out from the window just past the fence, and on the other side of it there was much more blood drying in a pool on the patio, as well as more smears higher up on the wall of the house. Again, it looked like the person had hidden there behind the AC unit for a while, and by this point we were certain that it was a person and not an animal partly because of the sheer amount of blood and partly because the smears on the side of the house were up higher, as if a person had leaned against the house with blood on their hands or upper body. The trail then picked up again, but with smaller spatters, as if they had managed to control the bleeding somewhat. The track went across the patio and out into the backyard, where it was difficult to follow through the grass. At the far back fence, some of the honeysuckle vines that grew over the fence had been pulled and the fence was bent, as if someone had climbed over it there, and again there were some smears of blood on the vines. From there, the trail ran out into the street behind my parents' house, where it became nearly impossible to follow. It was pretty clear that someone had been injured and was also trying to hide, which implied that someone else had caused the injury and was looking for them. Whatever the injury was, it must have been fairly serious because they lost quite a bit of blood in my parents' yard alone. They had come down the driveway from the main road, and they clearly knew that they could cut through the yard to reach the back street and the neighborhood or the forest beyond. My dad asked the night security guard at the local school if he'd heard anything on the police scanners that night about anything weird going on, but the guard hadn't heard anything. My mom told me a few days later that the neighbor who lives on the street behind them told her that he'd had insomnia that night and had heard someone running down the street around 3 a.m., and had also seen a dark-colored truck make several slow passes up and down the street. I'd asked my parents if they wanted to call the police to report whatever this was. They were both in their late 60s at the time, and I worried about them being alone while they were creepy things, presumably involving violence, that were clearly going on right outside their house. My mom declined, not only because there was nothing the police could do, but also because she worried the police might have been involved somehow with what had happened. The local cops had a reputation for being corrupt, so she didn't want to have any sort of involvement. 
So I took the hose and a scrub brush and did my best to wash away all traces of whatever it was that had happened the previous night. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well for the remainder of that trip home, nor on subsequent visits. It was kind of like being in a house in a slasher film. Not the house where the actual violence takes place, but the one down the street where the hero or heroine of the movie runs and hides outside while being pursued by the killer, and the neighbor only finds out the next morning, off screen, that something bad was happening just outside while they slept. Definitely a creepy feeling, and much closer than I ever want to be to that kind of situation. Before we go, a listener voicemail. My name is Cheyenne, and I'm a student at Auburn University. I commute about an hour and a half from home to school multiple times a week, and your podcast is the perfect amount of time to make the drive fly by. The stories always have me looking in my back seat to make sure nobody is about to murder me, and I love it. I just have one question. Do you know where Timothy Bender is today and what he's doing with his life? Thanks. Thanks for calling in. Now, Cheyenne's question references our episode on Timothy Bender, so go back and listen if you haven't already. And try as I might, I wasn't able to find any news about Timothy from within the last 10 years, or if he's even still alive at this point. It's important to note that he was never arrested or charged in any of those cases. He would be 72 years old now if he is still out there. Thanks for the call. Our voicemail line is always open, 701-354-3667. If you prefer to text, you can do that too. And if you'd like to help us grow, simply share the show with a friend or two. Disturbed is a Disturbed Audio original podcast. Musical score by White Bat Audio, Co.ag, and Kevin Hartnell. Thanks for listening. We'll be back December 31st with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all. <laughs>